Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time to see then what's making the headlines with the PR consultant Alex Dean and the journalist and broadcaster Jenny Kleeman with us from now until just before midnight. And welcome to both of you. Thank you. So front pages, let's kick off with the Financial Times, leading with Birmingham Council declaring itself bankrupt after millions of pounds worth of equal pay claims. Front page of the Metro, what a fine mess. They lead with an investigation into companies dumping untreated sewage on fine days. NHS staff told to watch out for concrete danger signs. That's the lead story for the eye. The Times says people with mobility and mental health problems will be told to look for jobs they can do from home as the government tries to cut the number of benefits claimants. Daily Star reports on a driver who crashed through the Great Wall of China to take a shortcut to work. Not surprisingly, the driver was arrested. And The Sun says Philip Schofield unfollowed Holly Willoughby on social media ahead of the National TV Awards. Well, quick reminder, don't forget to scan the QR code that you'll see on screen during the programme and you can check out for yourself those front pages while you listen to our guests. So let's head straight to them, to Jenny and Alex. Welcome to both of you. Um, so, Birmingham, let's go to that first of all. Another council, Alex, in financial difficulty. Uh, you know, talk us through the basis of this. It's IT sure. and it's equal pay claims. It's a it? long-standing issue, but it now bites Europe's largest local authority. And um, to use the terms that the union's concerned have been using, men's jobs and women's jobs, or jobs that tend to be female-dominated, which have received uh, lower rates of pay and lower bonuses, uh, not just over a month or two either, either, but over very long periods of time. And um, Birmingham, whoops, would you believe it, opened the cupboard, looked in an envelope and found they had another £760 million of liability. Having outstanding. already paid more. Having already paid out, I think, a billion, billion. Uh, pound figure. Yeah. And what this ha has meant is that effectively, using Section 114, they go back, they pare down on what they do to an absolute minimum of council activities. If you live in Birmingham, don't worry, the council still exists, they're still going to do their basic responsibilities, and it's an open plea to get to national government, now come and help us out. So an awful lot of things that the council normally does will be abandoned, essential services will not be. So do you cut the, cut the grass in parks? You know, what sort of, you know, clearing and cleaning will, will be underway? Who knows? As Alex said, the conversations are underway. It's not the first council that has had this issue, though. No, but uh, it's a very large council, largest in Europe, a million people um, affected by it. I would just say, I don't necessarily agree with this headline. It declares itself bankrupt after equal pay drains resources. You could put it another way, which says, after failing to pay women what they were due, uh, meant savings for years that they now have to pay back. I mean, this is completely avoidable. This is mismanagement. There's also £100 million pounds worth uh, of... of lost money from this botched IT failure. Uh, and it's a real shame because Birmingham was meant to be having this golden decade yeah, after the, the Commonwealth Games yeah. last year. You'd be very worried if you were living in Birmingham and some of the people from the most uh, deprived households in the country do live in the area that is uh, looked after by Birmingham City Council. The, the, the worry is that this is a sign of things to come. There are other local authorities who are using their reserves for day-to-day -day spending. And there is this eternal tension between local government and central government. Central government thinks local government manages things badly. Uh, local government thinks central government doesn't give them enough money. There will always be this backwards and forwards. But there has been a real strain on finances uh, in the decade of austerity for, uh, for local government organisations. Well, I was going to raise exactly that. Are we once again and seeing another austerity legacy story. The schools is one, as we know, yeah. which we'll come on to in just a moment. Here we are, though. We know that councils lost some of their Treasury cash during this period, and ultimately, you know, they couldn't make it work long term. Well, Jenny is definitely right. There's a tension between national and local government. You're also right, that's been with us for as long as we've had both forms of government. Unfashionably, I'm a strong believer in local government. I think we should devolve more and let local governments make more decisions. But to be clear, a greater settlement would just have meant more money for this uh, payout, which almost certainly still wouldn't have been met. This is a huge liability. 1.7 billion, even if they'd been given a quite significantly larger grant over years, they still wouldn't have been able to meet this. Add on top the incompetence over the £100 million pound IT uh, debacle, it's very difficult to see this is anyone else's fault than Birmingham Council. Well, I think I heard they were £800,000 short after, you know, Treasury withdrawals of cash. Uh, Woking was another council that was building projects mm. as well. Yeah. You know, as you say, more possibly to come. Uh, more to come on the, the rack issue too, concrete. Yes. Uh, now we're turning our attention to uh, the NHS, to hospitals. You know, start looking out for it, we're they're told. 
the anatomy of a story. What are we on? Day three of this. It's, it's now the focus yeah. is on the NHS. There have been pictures all over the news of hospitals propped up with, you know, temporary scaffolds, iron bars. Terrifying if you're a patient in there. Also, we've been talking about the prison estate. We've been talking about military barracks. This is going to be going on and on through successive government departments. Uh, and it is incredibly worrying and also totally avoidable because people have been banging on about this kind of concrete uh, for a long time. And there is a lot of buck passing. Uh, the fact is, I think, if you are the Secretary of State for Education or for Health, the buck should stop with you, yeah. uh, regardless of uh, who might on paper be responsible. We started with schools because nobody wants to see children in their classrooms being crushed by a ceiling falling in. Next, we have the NHS. Nobody wants patients in that, in that position. Prisoners don't have a choice of, of, of where they're going to be. It's going to go on and on, maybe in, in order of, uh, of emergency. But, you know, we saw this coming. People have been reporting on this for a very long time and, you know, secretaries of state Indeed. should have acted sooner. And in hospitals, of course, this has been white, like yeah. explicitly known for longer. There are hospitals which have these metal kind of girder things that have been put in place. When they thought these ceilings were a bit more stable than it turns out they are, they put in these... I mean, including in, like, operating theatres and um, down long corridors and so forth. So this has been a feature of some hospitals for some time. I have a different bet about where it goes next, given my background, which I think magistrates' courts are very likely to be the next one. If you think about the, the round of court closures that we've seen in recent times, what got closed was the nice Victorian building mm. that could plausibly be turned into a hotel and didn't come up to um, disability access standards. And what the work got moved to was the 1950s to 1990s type concrete building. Mm. And we've already got an enormous backlog of work in our court system because of coronavirus. Close the courts because of this. It's going to get even God. worse. Mm. Well, the uh, the slightly uh, alarmist second paragraph in this I story, the I learns structural failure cannot be fully ruled out as desperate managers in seven hospitals fight to prevent what they call catastrophic failure from the crumbling concrete that has closed schools. And in fact, tonight, um, the director of estates and facilities for NHS England has written to all trusts uh, saying that they need to ensure all recommended steps have been taken to maintain the safety of staff, patients and visitors. Uh, this is Simon Corbyn saying that the NHS has undertaken significant work over the last four years to identified the extent of rack within hospitals and other trust buildings and have put in place a national programme with mitigation, monitoring and eradication in line with expert guidance from the Institution of Structural Engineers. Well, the thing is that hospitals, you know, you can't suddenly work remotely no, in quite. a hospital. You can't do it from home. This is a real crisis. And, you know, there, there is such pressure on government to be able to say, we've built X number of you know, new schools or, or, or new hospitals that have been created on, on our watch. It isn't so sexy to say, oh, we actually rebuilt the roof that was made of the wrong thing. Uh, and and this, is, this has potentially enormous implications because there's no for patients, patients to go in these cases. Well, see, I don't envy Mr Corbyn his efforts to try and um, keep hospitals open and assess what's going on, not least because the same people are now try who have the expertise to diagnose, effectively, this condition in concrete, which is not straightforward, presumably, because it had been missed before, as people did their reviews and surveys, and signed off buildings, which turns out are not, not now safe. The same relatively small group of experts are being sought for all of these things. Yeah. Mm. So if you're even on the facts that, as we know them so far, which from the Secretary of State for Education seems to be that things which have been signed off now seem unsafe, if you're going to have the seal of assurance that this building is OK, who is going to give it mm. to you? Because mm. the same small group of professionals being pursued yeah. by hospital managers, uh, um, school managers, uh, those in charge of the prison estates, courts and so forth. Council it's, buildings. It's the next new business to be in, obviously, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but the complexity, because you might have asbestos there, you can't just drill in, yeah. see if there's rack. You've got to go in the right way. Um, and perhaps, but, you know, Gillian Keegan needs to bear that in mind when she tells schools off for not responding to the questionnaire. Um, just very quickly on that, did she open a Pandora's box? Did she jump the gun? Who sanctioned her with this decision to close these specific schools, uh, the 104, um, you know, that we heard about. You know, what, what of other... What, what, was the rest of Cabinet warned about it, do you think, before um, they returned on, on, on Monday to Westminster? Don't know. And whilst we're always fascinated by process stories, most people tend not to be. But I tell you what, it's the flip side of what Jenny was saying about the buck stopping somewhere. Mm -hmm. If the Secretary of State was presented with facts like this and, you know, basically the roof may fall into a classroom full of children, I'm glad she acted as she did. 
Mm. OK, safety first. Um, to the Times now. Um, energy discounts for customers who back local wind farms. Uh, the government, uh, one might say, coming kicking in, screaming to changing the rules for England, at least, to yes. theoretically make it easier for onshore, so on land, wind farms to be built. And the idea is that you reward communities, you give them payback, which we see in other parts of the world, like yes. oil, yeah. you know, Richard. I think this sounds like quite a smart idea. This isn't part of policy yet. This is one of Michael Gove's uh, ideas, which is that local communities if they accept onshore wind farms, mm. that maybe they should have reduced bills. I think this is, a, this is a good idea. This is sensible. We need more of this kind of thinking. Then people can choose to move into an area and have cheaper bills, even though there's a wind farm. I mean, I find all of this quite depressing in that, as I always say, I was old enough to remember uh, COP26 less than two years ago, <laughs> when uh, everyone was saying, onshore wind farms, it only takes two years to put one of them up. If we had been able to do this two years ago, we would already have them. It is a cheap form of energy. They are, it is the quickest new form of energy uh, to put up. It is ridiculous that it's taken this long for these amendments to this bill to be made. More of this, please. We need energy independence. Uh, we need to not be dependent on fossil fuels and we need to not be dependent on Russia. And I think, you know, some people would back it if it meant that they had cheaper bills. Yeah, I, I embrace that kind of flexible approach. I mean, I'd extend it to nuclear. I think that people who got... But it know, takes 10 years to well, I, yeah. But if you're going to move into an area that's got a nuclear facility or you, you're being asked if you'll, you'd approve of one coming in, why shouldn't you have cheaper bills as a result? And and moreover, if you're not going to oppose the new housing estate, if you're going to be willing to say, yes, in my backyard, I welcome this development, you should get a lower council tax bill, in my view. The trouble is, for, for people, the, the amenities are, fluctuate and there aren't enough of them, and the costs are fixed. Your council bill doesn't go down, uh, even though more people move in. You don't get a discount on your energy bill, even though the mast goes up. So actually, we should show. Will you show that bit more but, flexibility? But I thought the argument was that communities aren't getting a say in those local housing projects. The council deems it's going there. The developer benefits, sure. and the communities but, don't have a say. Jenny's point, with which I was agreeing, was yeah. that if you do give people a say and then give them an incentive to say yes, then, then they're going to feel far more invested in what happens in their yeah. community, and that can include something that's really good for the environment. Yeah. And the difficulty is the Conservative Party is more protective of the NIMBY. The NIMBY is the person in their mind who has worked all their life, put their money into their hands. House with a beautiful view, which is then ruined. So is the NIMBY a sort of, a, a sort of put, think, supported entity I, for some parties? No, I think, I think the NIMBY is, is a figment of, of certain imagination. I'm sure, I think people are more flexible than that. There may be some people who, who, who feel that way, but I think there are many more people who would much rather have cheaper bills and us not being beholden to rogue states and, yeah. and, and having our own source of, of energy. I agree with you. It may well be the case on something like this. Oh, when it came to the HS2 and the Cheshire Man Amish and by-election, yeah. I can tell you NIMBYism is definitely... Well, they may have a very strong point, right? But it definitely exists. Mm. Mm. Uh, very quick one, if you don't mind. Arm shares, front page of the Financial Times suggesting some big companies are buying in. Is that right? Yes, let's be clear. That more than 90% of Arm... Explain Wilson. the company first so of all. Arm is a UK-based chip manufacturer. Ooh. It's been owned for some time now by SoftBank, which is only um, in its IPO selling a little under 10% of, of the business. It's still going to... It puts the valuation of the business between 50 and $60 billion. So it's... Boy, we wished it was being listed in the UK rather than overseas. Yeah. Uh, and I can't help but notice that most of the cornerstone businesses that it will be buying up this 10% are its own customers. Hmm. Interesting. OK, uh, lots more still to come, including this fascinating story, The Great Fool of China, how uh, one person's shortcut to work ended in arrest. Uh, one wonders why. I think you'll see back in a moment. We're returning to our press preview now. Jenny Cleam and Alex Dean are here with me. Goodness, what are we going to next? I think it might be the weather. Yes. yes. Isn't it? Anyway, Jenny. Uh, it's, it might be 32 degrees tomorrow. This country, this summer has been ridiculous. Just as the kids so go back to school. News. <laughs> Just as the kids go back to school, it's one of those weird Septembers where it will be incredibly hot and all the wasps are horrible and uh, it'll be not great because the kids will be back at school. But there we go. The, this warmth follows, as it says, the sixth wettest July on record and a disappointing August. Uh, Temperatures back to average next week, but it does feel like the weather has gone bonkers. Does well, it not? but don't we every year get like an oh, it's a glorious Indian summer? Who ever saw that coming? Except it happens every year. Yeah, it's because the climate is changing. That's mm. the thing. Well, so we, we have year. great sympathy for all those in uh, in Greece, uh, in Skiathos, British tourists uh, trapped trying to find out about their their flights as well. So uh, we'll keep covering that for for now, both of you. Thank you very much indeed.